now. And thank you all for joining us. My name is Zach. I'm a senior admissions counselor here with the Keck Graduate Institute. I do see some familiar faces, people I've worked with before. Um, congratulations to those of you who have already been admitted, some of us who are joining us from some of our summer programs, and of course, some of our professors. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce our uh, opening speaker, Sarah, if you'd like. I would be uh, very happy if you could introduce yourself and, and uh, talk to the rest of the group. Yeah, sure. My name is Sarah Herman. I uh, am, I'm an MBS class of 2015 graduate. Um, I studied quality and regulatory and uh, bioprocessing. Um, my career was sort of a little bit wavy. Um, so I started at Illumina doing quality and regulatory complaint handling. Um, realized that that's not really my calling. Um, and I transitioned into business development, which is just a fancy way of saying sales. Um, so I, you know, I had some discussions um, with folks at KGI um, about maybe starting a sales program. You know, I think it's really an interesting avenue that's not always discussed, you know, in business school, we think of a lot of like data analysts and stuff, but uh, I'm here to tell you my experience, share a little bit more about my company and answer any of your questions if you're interested in uh, pursuing that kind of a career. Um, Zach, can you allow me to share my screen? Yes, let me see. I think it should give you the option, give it a try. Yeah, yeah, it's good now. Okay, great. All right, perfect. So I'm actually gonna turn my camera off just so that uh, sometimes it gets screwy when I'm presenting and have my camera on. So I'll turn it back on for questions for now. All right, everyone can see my screen. Everything's good? <clears throat> yes, yep, it looks great. great. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, Sarah, class of 2015. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, Let's go into an agenda. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my company, Certus Oncology, a little bit of our history and mission. I'll discuss some of our competitive advantages and services. And this is sort of the presentation that I give to certain customers. Um, so you get a little bit of an understanding of that. And then I'm going to talk about business development at Certus. So if you're interested in maybe a career in business development, that might be interesting for you. And then uh, I'll open up the floor to questions. So getting started. Um, so Sturgis Oncology was formed in 2016 and uh, we were basically founded, one of our founder's sons was uh, suffering from sarcoma, <clears throat> which is a kind of cancer. And he had undergone many different treatments, um, all of which had failed. Um, so his, our founder turned to UCLA for help. Um, and there he met two of our other founders who worked at UCLA. They're now on our board. Um, and they suggested the use of a really interesting new study using a mouse avatar that's implanted with the sun's cancer biopsy to then test cancer treatments in vivo and determine which might be the best, most effective next treatment to try. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, our founder's son died before the study was complete, um, but our founder was determined to make sure that other patients have access to that kind of study um, because some folks don't have any other choice and it's really, really helpful to find a treatment um, in areas like sarcoma that don't have a standard of care. So uh, they teamed up these three, um, these three founders and uh, created what is now Certus Oncology. So the heart of our business um, remains uh, precision patient-directed in vivo mouse avatar studies, um, in vivo meaning in animals, <clears throat> to test a variety of potential treatments for patients and see which is best likely to treat an individual patient's cancer. Um, from there, we've collected a number of very interesting, very clinically relevant low passage, which means they haven't been implanted, grown, resected, and implanted again to a new mouse. Um, for multiple generations, which is pretty common in this space. Um, so we have this, this collection of tumors that we can then use uh, for biotech and pharma companies to test their individual uh, investigational therapeutics. Um, so I'll go into the competitive advantages a little bit later. Um, but that said, our mission remains patient focused. We want to connect every patient to the right therapy for the individual cancer the first time, every time. So when lots of cancer patients try and fail various drugs before finding the right drug, you know, if they find the right drug, there's a lot of value and potential to save lives, save patients from the toll of multiple treatments, the toll of therapy after therapy being ineffective, the price for paying for all of that. It really just goes without saying, you know, the value of this kind of a, a, 
of a screening test. And our vision integrates what we call the pharma side, which is where we sell these tumors to um, biotech and pharma with the uh, patient side um, to create a future where cancer is powerless against our science. So Certus Oncology has three branches. I sort of mentioned our patient personalized oncology side. That's when we get a patient biopsy and replicate the cancer in mouse avatars and test relative efficacy of multiple therapeutics. Then we have our contract research services side, that's services for biotech and pharma clients who wanna do testing with these cancers. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have our molecular diagnostics. Uh, we're a CLIA certified lab, which means we can sort of provide these diagnos diagnosis to clients and patients. And we use that to do COVID-19 testing. So I'm not gonna talk about that too much. It's sort of a, it's a bit of a stopgap for us. You know, it's, it's been really helpful to keep us afloat. Um, we're a startup, so, we don't have tons of funds, um, but COVID testing has really provided a nice little lifeline for us as we get started. All right, so this is sort of the process for patient studies. So first we start with what's called a phase one study initiation. So we'll receive a patient tumor biopsy, and then we implant that in what we call seed mice, see if it grows. Uh, in parallel, if we have any extra, we'll cryopreserve it. Um, so if we need to go back to that, we can. Next, do the tumors grow? You know, if they don't, um, we can either get another biopsy or, you know, the study is ended. Um, unfortunately, if it, they don't grow, there's nothing to test off of. Um, but, uh, you know, if they don't grow, sometimes it's because we got maybe just too much star scar tissue, too much surrounding tissue that's not cancerous. You know, maybe it just doesn't grow in vivo, which is unfortunately sort of part of this study process is, you know, we don't know everything and sometimes things won't work the way they're expected. But when they do grow, we can move on to phase two, which is pharmacology, um, in which we sort of work with the patient and the patient's oncologist to decide on a panel of drugs that we're gonna test. And then we uh, implant however many mice are needed to make arms for all of those drugs. So generally we'll do five mice per arm. Um, and you know if they're doing say 10 different drugs, we implant 50 mice plus one and a half times overage so we can randomize. Um, so we'll implant those mice uh, with the tumor, we'll grow it up to the correct size and then we'll begin dosing with the drugs that were, uh, that were recommended by the oncologist. From there, um, we'll measure the tumor volume uh, via MRI. And uh, from there, we got a patient report that we can then share with the uh, patient and the oncologist to really make decisions on that patient's treatment. So now let's uh, take a look at sort of, we'll look at the status quo, what you know most oncologists, oncology companies are doing right now for in vivo testing. We're sort of looking more at the, uh, the pharma side of the business. And then we'll look at sort of our Certus method and compare, you know, how, see how Certus is innovating in this area. So first, most companies are doing this sort of in vivo study using sub subcutaneous implantation, which means sort of under the skin. And now obviously this isn't how most tumors form in humans. Um, generally, you know, they'll form in say the breast or the liver or whatnot. Um, but right now most folks use a subcutaneous implantation. Um, Certus prefers to implant orthotopically. Um, now ortho means in the usual place. Um, and uh, so that just means uh, like in a breast tissue, we'd put it in the mammary fat pad. If it's a glioblastoma tumor, we would put it intracranial um, in the brain, et cetera. So we like to put it where it belongs. Uh, next, a lot, of, a lot of studies, these in vivo studies will use immortalized cell line models, which are you know, easy to use, they're easy to get, they're easy to implant, um, and they're generally very well characterized and pretty predictable. Um, However, to get this kind of a predictable cell line, the original cancer cell line has been considerably altered. It's immortalized, it's homeoge homeogeneous um, instead of heterogeneous, um, as most cancer cell lines or cancers are, you know, in patients. So alternatively, Certus prefers the use of a patient-derived xenograft model, um, often called PDXs. You'll hear me refer to a PDX. That's this patient-derived xenograft. Um, so what does that mean? Um, xeno means foreign or other. So therefore, a xenograft is a graft from a donor of a different species than the recipient. So in this case, the donor is a human. They give their, uh, their cancer and then we implant that cancer in a mouse host. 
uh, and we prefer the use of a chunk PDX um, as opposed to a cell line because they really retain cell to cell adhesions, things like human stroma, human histological characteristics, immune cell infiltra infiltration, heterogeneity, et cetera. Now, next for immuno oncology studies, which is sort of a rising field uh, in oncology, you need a mouse that has an immune system for that immuno oncology drug to work with. Um, However, if you implant a human cancer in a immunocompetent mouse, meaning a mouse that has an immune system, it will reject the implant. Um, however, you, if you use a mouse cancer line in a mouse that has an immune system and an immunocompetent mouse, um, that's a good model for testing um, immuno-oncology compounds in vivo. Um, you know, it's cheap, it's a lot easier. Um, immuno-competent mice are generally a lot cheaper than immuno-compromised, meaning mice that don't have an immune system. Uh, the problem with this is it's mouse cancer, it's not human cancer. Um, so here at CERTUS, we have two different kinds of humanized mouse models. Um, which are immunocompromised mice um, that don't have an immune system that are then grafted with human immune cells to sort of create a pseudo human immune system. Uh, then a human cancer can be implanted and the immune system won't react to it um, because you know, cancer is generally very good at evading the immune system. Um, but in this case, you have a human immune components needed to test those immuno-oncology drugs mm. on then you can you know, implant a, a human PDX cancer and it's really a very human model. And lastly, there's lots of other things, but these are sort of the main reasons, um, main differences at service. Um, in a subcutaneous model, the tumor is right under the skin. So you can just measure with calipers. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of operator to operator variability um, and you can't use calipers if you're implanting uh, orthotopically or under the skin. You know, you can't reach into the brain with calipers and measure a tumor's growth. Um, but at CERTUS, we have uh, MRIs. We have two murine scale, meaning just small little mouse MRIs to be able to measure the tumor progress within the mouse. Um, and this also has the benefit of being objective and really removing that variability. And you get some pretty cool pictures as well to put in your publications or whatnot. Um, so, you know, at CERTUS, we offer what we consider the gold standard for translational drug development um, based on all those things I just presented. Um, and we have some data to prove it. I'll pr present some of that without getting too in the weeds. Um, but uh, first, it's sort of notable that we have data from our patient studies um, that have, you know, provided a tumor biopsy to CERTUS. We've created those mouse avatars. And then uh, we went on to use a drug that was recommended via their mouse avatars. Um, so not all patients report back to us, but of those that have, we found 100% um, negative concordance. That means if the mouse avatars say the drug will not be effective, it will not be effective in the patient. And 97% positive concordance. And that, that means that the mouse avatars predict that the drug will be effective. Uh, there is a high chance, 97%, that the drug will be effective in the human patient. And uh, as far as cancer goes, that's pretty darn good. Um, I know cancer can be pretty unpredictable, but uh, we, we, we see this as a win. And in addition to those things I mentioned, um, orthotopic PDX models have actually been seen to spontaneously metastasize in a way that subcutaneously implanted tumors don't. Um, and it could be due to things like angiogenesis or other properties of implanting the tumor deep within the body. And uh, we can really track that with things like luciferase tagged PDX derived cell lines. And that's a, a, a PDX that's then dis dissociated to form a cell line and then tagged with luciferase. So then we can image via bioluminescence and sort of see where that cell line migrates within the body. And uh, lastly, orthotopic implanted tumors better recapitulate the tumor microenvironment which is you know, a really important factor that I see in more and more clients and oncology companies um, as a therapeutic target, especially for certain immuno-oncology drugs. And uh, lastly, they better recapitulate histology, which I'll get into a little bit more in the next slide. So this is uh, an example of a patient study we performed for a treatment-naive 75-year-old male um, who had colorectal adenocarcinoma and liver metastasis. So, 
We took his tumor and we decided to implant both subcutaneously and orthotopically and compare the two models, see how they differ. Um, so at first glance, you'll notice that the growth curves are pretty different. Um, so the, uh, they, uh, the subcutaneous model grew to about 200 millimeters cubed, whereas the orthotopic model only grew to about 800 millimeters cubed. So the kinetics are a bit different. Um, but then you'll also notice that they inhibited, uh, the treatments inhibited tumor uh, growth in a different way as well. So in the subcutaneous model, you'll see that full fairy and full fox performed about the same. But in the orthotopic model, um, full fairy is clearly a better uh, tumor inhibition than the uh, full fox treatment. And uh, also, I'm not a histologist, but you can still sort of see that this histology in the subcutaneous side looks pretty different from the histology in the orthotopic side. Um, and uh, you'll see that there's this clear, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, um, but on the very bottom histology picture in the full fairy, there's a clear tumor border. So you can see where the tumor is and where the healthy, tu the healthy uh, surrounding tissue is, and that's indicative of regression. And uh, as sort of a cherry on top, the patient actually did go on full fairy and saw a good response. So that's a that's a positive thing. And that's sort of the most rewarding thing in this job is when, you know, they go through all this trouble to have these studies done and then they see really good responses in the clinic. All right. Additionally, it's really interesting to have these orthotopic models to model things like recurrence or resistance in the patient. And I'm sure you're aware that, you know, oftentimes patients might respond to a first line treatment, but recurrence and uh, resistance is a pretty common issue um, in these patients after they go on a maybe successful first line treatment. So in this example, um, you'll see the uh, mice really responded really well to this red treatment, the gemcitabine and doxetacil. Um, however, if you let them be, the tumor will actually uh, reoccur. And then if you restart the treatment with the gemcitabine doxetaxel, which was effective, very effective before, it actually loses efficacy. And you'll see around day 90-ish, the tumor starts hugely proliferating again. Um, so at this point, you know, we, we want to use a model like this to be able to test other drugs to see what second line therapy would be effective. Uh, on these mice avatars that see this um, this treatment resistance, and then recommend those to the patient. So when you know their their uh, tumor reoccurs, they have some more options. Now this is sort of an eye chart. I'm not going to leave you on it for too long. This is sort of what I show my pharma clients um, when I have calls with them. Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit better for you. So starting with sort of the heart of our business, um, our in vivo services, we can do all kinds of things. Um, we can do things like uh, studies in mice. I've sort of discussed that a little bit with you. We can do things like efficacy, which is testing different therapeutics. PK and BD is evaluating, you know, what the drug does to the body and what the body does to the drug. Dose finding, you know, where to even start dosing uh, in vivo, tolerability, how well is the drug tolerated. And uh, we are very good at custom model creation. And that's really just taking primary patient tissue or even like a, a standard cell line and creating a, a PDX model with it for our clients to use. And now to be able to do all of this highly technical orthotopic implantation that I discussed earlier, uh, we'll need a surgical team that's highly trained. Um, and now mice are really small. So these surgeries need to be just incredibly precise. So just imagine injecting like a thousandth of a drop into a mouse brain at a very specific coordinate. Um, these folks are just super highly trained to be, ever, be able to do that for like a hundred mice that are on study. Um, and additionally, sometimes we'll need to resect the tumor or other organs for follow-on studies. You know, we'll need to make slides stain them to view the histolo histological characteristics or take a bunch of different tissues to you know, maybe see where the drug went. And uh, again, that's highly skilled work um, that needs to be performed in a very hyper st sterile environment. So we have the capabilities to do those things. I mentioned that we needed an MRI to be able to see the tumors implanted into the, mi into the mice. Um, and now that's part of uh, our advanced imaging suite. 
Uh, we also have a machine that measures bioluminescence. I sort of mentioned that earlier. Um, we can transfect our PDX drive cell lines with luciferase to track metastasis. Mm -hmm. I haven't really mentioned this one yet, um, but we have a precision irradiator. Um, many cancers have radiation as a standard of care, particularly glioblastoma, which is one of our areas of expertise. So we have a, an irradiator to do that kind of work. Next, uh, we have a full in vitro lab to do things like endpoint analysis. Like maybe you wanna resect the tumor and see via flow cytometry what immune cells have infiltrated the tumor. We have the capabilities to do these kinds of things. Um, we also use our in vitro team to do plate-based assays with our PDX drive cell lines as a screening um, to see which PDX models they might want to use for follow-on studies, um, the in vivo follow-on studies, which are you know much more expensive. So, so it's a good cost-effective first screening step to in vivo. And last but certainly not least, our bioinformatics team uh, helps us compile data on our models. Um, they do things like analyze our gene expression via RNA-seq, gene mutations via whole, gene, whole exome sequencing. Um, and they've recently been doing different kinds of studies, like uh, performing some really interesting machine learning predictive biomarker algorithms, um, which is basically based on a set of biomarkers. Will this particular cancer respond to this particular treatment? And it's really interesting stuff um, to be able to sort of pre-screen prior to to treating with something that a patient might not be likely to respond to. All right, so that's all of CERTIS. Now I'm gonna get into a little bit of uh, business development at CERTIS, um, which is basically a fancy way of saying sales. I'm a salesperson. Um, this is just sort of a streamlined, very optimistic, uh, simplified expression of what the sales process is. It's never like this. Um, but this is sort of what it is at its core. Um, so a client will express it, their need to serve us. Maybe it's through a marketing campaign. Maybe they're referred. Maybe, you know, I sent a sales outreach email and they contacted me back saying, yes, I'm interested. Maybe we met at a conference, et cetera. So there's lots of ways that clients find us. Uh, the next step is, can we meet this client's need? Do we even want to do this kind of work? So we're a startup, you know, we don't have infinite resources. We want to be very careful about the kinds of studies we say yes to, because it means we're saying no to other studies. So that's an important consideration. Um, if we do meet the client's need, we can do the kind of study and we want to do it. Uh, generally, we'll get a CBA in place, and that's really just uh, confidentiality so that we can speak more openly. We'll have a meeting or maybe meetings with a client. I'll pull in, you know, our lab folks, operations, subject matter experts, and we'll define the scope of the need. We'll sort of draft out a study protocol, um, all of that good stuff so that I understand fully what they need. From there, you know, is it still in scope? Are there any additional items that I could suggest that might be helpful? Um, you know, sometimes folks don't think of the full scope of what we have to offer. They're very laser focused on, you know, what they think they need. Um, and sometimes they need to be introduced to some other things that they may not have heard of that we can do um, to better perform their study. So I like to introduce those, really explore whether they need them or not. Sometimes they ask for things that they really don't need. So sometimes it's not an upsell, it's a downsell. It's saying, hey, you know, you asked for this, but maybe that's not necessary. My dog is in the background. Um, don't mind her. But it's not always upselling the client. Sometimes it's uh, refining the scope of their question to something that's more manageable. And uh, next, once we're ready to go forward, I draft a statement of work. Um, and these are all, you know, with our company, they're all very customized. So every statement of work is different. Every quote is different and customized. I'll review those with operations, um, my leadership and the client and make sure that the statement of work is acceptable. From there, either the client signs or they decline, they say, no, I'm so sorry, that's not quite what we're looking for. We decided to go with another company or you know, maybe it was too expensive, whatnot. Or they'll ghost me, which is just horrifyingly common um, where I'll just never hear from someone again. And that's just a part of the process. And when, that, when those things happen, I uh, close it as lost. So all of this is you know, in our CRM, customer relationship management software, we use um, Salesforce. 
and uh, we'll document maybe why that was lost. Um, maybe it was too expensive. Maybe they wanted to do a different study and we couldn't do it, something like that, but that's all documented. From there, let's say it is signed. That's great. Um, we need a master services agreement and MSA, which really outlines the relationship between what CERTUS is expected to do and what the client is expecting of us and all those um, articulations. I'll hand off the study to operations who will then um, perform the actual study. Um, any, you know, client specifications, you know, maybe saying, hey, this guy, you know, really prefers being called versus email, all of those things are handled in that handoff. And uh, then I document it and the CRM is closed one. Yay, money. And then uh, the study director manages the study, but it's not over. Um, the business development person still needs to monitor the study to really know when to start discussing follow-ons. Um, right now, hopefully this won't be my responsibility for too much longer, but I still manage you know, when we're doing invoicing. Um, so I work closely with the accounting to do the invoicing and also when to recognize revenue. So. When we close that study, that doesn't mean we've recognized all of our revenue. We have to sort of uh, schedule it out um, according to how long the study is going to take and the invoices and all that good stuff. And like I said, all of this is documented, every single step in the CRM. So a lot of my job is just documentation, making sure everything's written down, all the numbers match, all that good stuff. So. What skills are needed for a salesperson? You might have this picture of what a salesperson is in your mind. Maybe they're charming, maybe they're outgoing, maybe they're talkative, persuasive, they're really money focused. I don't think any of this is really necessarily the picture of what you want a salesperson to be. Of course, being charming is never gonna be a bad thing, um, but you don't have to be these things. I am not these things. <laughs> And I am a salesperson, depending on how successful you think I am. I don't know, that depends. Um, what I found to be more important is being organized. So you really have to have your ducks in a row. You can't you know, forget clients. Sometimes they'll ask you about something and you have a million other things to go do at that time. Um, it's really important to you know, not leave any of your clients in the lurch. Really write down everything, be organized. It's important to be a team player. You know, as a business development person, you are interacting with the client, but also operations, finance, study directors, operations, uh, regulatory, you know, management. They want to know about your numbers, you know, so you really sort of hit every part of an organization. And it's really important that you're man able to manage those relationships in a way that sometimes maybe you're Maybe you're asking for things when someone's already busy, you know, you just sometimes maybe someone's asking you for something and you're busy, but it's really important to manage that relationship with your team as well as with the client. Uh, you have to be willing to learn. Um, so I started this job about a year ago um, and I didn't know anything about oncology. This is all brand new to me. <laughs> so if it seems like a lot to you, you know, I learned all of this in a year and it's, um, I'm always learning new things. Every study is different. Every client has a different uh, source of knowledge and expertise. And it's really important that I sort of try to understand where they're coming from so that I'm not at too high of a level or too low of a level. And it's really important to, you know, just keep learning. It's always important. It doesn't matter what career you're at. That's always gonna be an important uh, aspect to have. Um, all of these are pretty important to pretty much every career. Um, being persistent is something that's maybe a little bit more unique to business development. So sometimes clients ghost you, they don't respond. I send them three emails in a row over the course of a couple months, nothing. But I've had sometimes, you know, that fourth email, it turns into a study. They email me back and they say, yeah, Sarah, we're ready to start talking about a study. Um, and it's important to not just be annoying, um, to be politely persistent. You know, maybe the client's annoyed, but you know, it's you're you're not being annoying. You're being very polite, so they can't be too annoyed at you. But um, I find I found that you know, oftentimes that persistence is really important to actually getting some deals closed. And sometimes people are just busy. You know, they're not trying to be rude. They just have other things going on. You know, it's it's important to keep following up with them because otherwise they'll forget about these goals that they have that they want to do with you. And lastly, client focus. So. You know, as business development, um, we serve the client. You know, sometimes our management will want us to do things that's more 
company uh, oriented as opposed to client oriented. And it's our job to be that voice of the customer and say, hey, you know, they need this. Can we do it in this way to get them what they need? Sometimes it doesn't always work out. Sometimes the clients are unreasonable, but it's important to have someone who is that client advocate. And uh, if anyone's interested in sales, I'm gonna share three of my favorite resources um, that you can look up after this to sort of go into. Um, first, The Challenger Sale is a super classic book. Um, these authors researched a bunch of different salespeople and sales styles. They identified a methodology that's common to a lot of high performers. Um, and they classified this as a, a challenger, a challenger salesperson. Um, and these people, uh, they teach, tailor and um, take control. So for example, in my job, maybe that's, you know, I challenge the view that the client has about using, uh, say, cell line sub Q models and say, you know, maybe that's not the best uh, methodology. So it's really about, it's really about teaching your prospects and your clients about what's best for their business. It's less about just taking orders and more about really being able to tailor a solution to them. And then it's easy to sell once it's tailored to them. But that whole process, is, it's very interesting. It's probably relevant to anyone just sort of understanding how to have that kind of a conversation. Uh, next is spin selling, which is a pretty similar idea, uh, but it presents a sales structure in which you ask a couple of different kinds of questions. You ask situation questions, problem questions, implication questions and need payoff questions to really lead your client into seeing the benefit of your solution, not in the context of your solution, but in the context of solving their problem. And lastly, uh, how to win friends and influence people. And despite this being kind of old and having like a sleazy title, I think it's actually a really great read that um, really centers around how to be a pleasant, empathetic person that other people want to be around. Um, and the tactics are things like taking an active interest in people, you know, getting them to talk about themselves and you really listening to them. And if you're wrong, you admit it and take times to see things from other people's perspective. So it's, it's not about necessarily manipulating people. It's about being a nice person, really. Um, and there's definitely... <laughs> some dated things about this book, um, but it's one that I find myself coming back to and that I recommend. Um, and uh, lastly, these are some tips that helped me. Um, you know, I'm not a natural salesperson. I'm not that like uh, outgoing, good at giving public speeches kind of person. Uh, but you know, these are some things that I found that were helpful for me. So I create a cheat sheet in Word. Um, and it's all in Word. I have like a 75 page document now that I just put all of my notes into. Um, I organize it by sort of title. So I'll have like an in vitro and an in vivo section where all my notes go. Um, and I like that because it's searchable. So it's one source of truth. I can just control F and see if I have anything on a certain topic. And if I don't, I'll ask and get my question answered. I also do that for meeting notes. So I have a huge document that's the first half of the year of 2022. It's extremely long, um, but you know, if I'm looking for, you know, oh, I had this discussion with this client, uh, you know, earlier this year, and now I'm going to try to contact the, the, them again, and I want to see what we talked about. I can Control F, find those notes, read over them, and it's a lot easier than digging through your CRM. But then I, you know, copy them into the CRM and whatnot for documentation and management visibility. But I, I find it's more easier. It's, it's easier to search in that one document. Uh, I also like to make meetings with myself. So sometimes you just get really, really busy um, with other things. Um, but you have to find time to do things like review your CRM and make sure that everything in there is correct. Uh, you mean you need to do things like goal setting, you know, you made goals at the beginning of the year. That's something that you always do as a salesperson. You sort of need to check in periodically and make sure you're on track. Um, uh, you need to always be learning. You need to study new material. Um, you need to find time to find new customers. Otherwise, you'll find yourself at some point having no one asking for your services. So I like to make meetings, like block my calendar off so I can do these things. I'm not always good about honoring them, but uh, most of the time I do. And I find it's a good way to get some time alone without people trying to, trying to set meetings on my calendar. Um, 
Uh, another thing, and this is, again, this is useful for any job that you'll find yourself in, actively seek feedback. So from managers, from your colleagues, from your customers, from your potential customers, they can provide you some really important information about how to do your job better. And uh, of course, it's really important to reflect and actually implement that feedback into your job and your performance. And along with that, actively seek help. You know, managers, colleagues, they have maybe already solved your problem, especially if you're a junior member like I am. You know, I don't know everything and these people know a lot more than I do. So being able to leverage their expertise is really helpful for me to be able to, you know, do my job better and not spend a ton of time researching things that I don't have to. And then of course, when you get this data, add it to your cheat sheet so you can find it next time and you're not asking the same questions over and over again. And uh, lastly, you know, invest in your own self-improvement. Um, read these books, listen to podcasts, read papers, you know, go to company websites and read them. Uh, my, my favorite thing to do is I'll like pull up YouTube during my lunch break and I'll type in like immuno-oncology or like intro to immunology and I'll watch a video about this topic. And it's just, it's a nice little relaxation thing to do, but you're also learning. Um, and sometimes they break it down better than you know, maybe reading some dense academic paper would do, and it provides a base of knowledge that's really helpful. So that's it. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen and start my video again. Um, wait, I didn't do that. Let's figure out how to do that. How long have we been doing this kind of thing? No, I want to unshare. Stop share. There we go. All right. But uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have come up with. Um, we have plenty of time, so. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that. We actually had a couple of questions uh, and some of them have been very good. So if you want, we'll start with the first one from Lily. Uh, she asked, what are you considering and evaluating when determining if you do want to do this kind of work from a client? Do you consider the client's reputation, their branding, their ethics? Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, those are all great things to consider. Um, a lot of times we'll consider if they have the money for it. So do they have the funding? Um, some of these studies can be very expensive. Oftentimes, you know, if they have a good reputation or they have a good founder, we trust them enough to get into bed with them, so to speak. That's sort of crude, but um, that's part of it. Another part of it is, you know, we are solely an in vivo orthotopic PDX company. And that's the work that we want to do. We have things like in vitro lab work, um, we have histology, but do we wanna be like sort of a very, do we wanna do just sort of like basic histology work? Probably not. So could we, yes. Do we want to, is it aligned with our goals as like a highly scientific organization? Maybe not, um, but you know, is it gonna lead to in vivo work um, that does align with our goals? You know, it, it's sort of a, it's a complex and it's a very, uh, case by case basis kind of thing. Um, but those are some of the things that we think about. We, we usually say yes, you know, we're not in the business of saying no too much, but sometimes it's something that we really don't want to do or we don't have the resources for. So, you know, it's something that we do want to think about as we move forward. So great question. Yeah, good start. Awesome. And with that in mind, Lily actually actually asked a second question that was very good. So she asked, uh, do you have any advice or tips on writing those persistent, polite emails to clients? Is an email once a week too much? How much of a time frame and then how long between a time frame for an email? When should we pause on communication? So it sounds like she wants to know, how do you find that line with, you know, connecting with these clients and not maybe being a little too overbearing? Yeah. And I always feel like I'm being annoying. Um, so it's, it's really been a change for me for some of these clients to come back and say, you're not being annoying, thank you for following up, for me to actually believe that that's something that's helpful. Um, and you know, we always get these emails that are just not relevant to us. So I think emailing the right people is important. Um, so if it's relevant to them, it's not gonna be as annoying as if you're emailing someone that just will never need your services. Don't even waste your time. But um, I have a cadence where, you know, it depends on if they came to us or if I sent a, cold email to them. So if it's a cold email, it's not as urgent. I generally give them like a month, maybe, you know, maybe two weeks if they're like a really highly qualified prospect, which means that they could really benefit from these services and they could use them. 
Um, if it's someone that reached out to me and I send them a response and said, hey, you know, maybe let's have a meeting or here's some data, what do you think? Then I'll follow up in maybe a week. Um, and if they still don't respond, maybe it's two weeks for the next one. And if they still don't respond, maybe it's three weeks and I send them an email that says, hey, are you still interested? You know, and that gives them a chance to say no or say, yes, I'm so sorry, I'm really busy. Um, so, you know, it's really about being client focused, but also not letting them slip through the cracks. And it really depends, you know, if you have a feeling that someone's like kind of annoyed, you can push it out a little further. Or if they're really interested, you can have it a little sooner. Um, but I like to set tasks for myself in Salesforce, um, which is the CRM. So I'll have a task, you know, today I have like 20 tasks and I'll just go through them. And some of them are follow-ups, some, the, some of them are other things, um, but that's how I sort of track those follow-ups. So yeah, hope that answered your question. Perfect. So the next question is from Lilia. Uh, she asks, thank you for the presentation and all the advice and all the tips. And obviously she says it's a pleasure to listen and, and, and learn from you, but she really wants to know the best strategy to find a partner or client to, to succeed in business development or AKA sales, as you put it. Um, so do you mean like how to get employed or I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, like where to find a job? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point of clarification. Uh, if you don't mind, Lilia, what, what could you clarify a little bit more what you meant by your question? I know she doesn't have access to her camera or her mm. microphone because she's um, she's transitioning. So I'll tell you what, we'll ask the right. next question if you want. Go ahead and use the chat uh, to clarify that question. So uh, we actually have a question from Emmanuel who asked, what tactics do you use to identify high intent customers while prioritizing your sales funnel? Yeah, so I mean, it's sort of interesting, you know, sometimes there are people that, you know, they come to us, they have something that's right in our wheelhouse, maybe it's, you know, I want to run a glioblastoma, glioblastoma study. Yes, we can do that. It's in vivo. You want an intracranial? Great. That's right down what exactly what we want to do. So that's sort of the highest priority. And those people sometimes are like, yeah, we want to get a study going right away. That's going to go right to the top of my, of my to-do list. Um, sometimes there are people that ask for things that are kind of like, sort of what we do, you know, maybe they want breast models and we only have four of them right now, but we're getting more. So, you know, maybe you're not as high priority now, maybe you like some of those breast models. So you go back to the top. Um, with regards to prospecting, um, you know, I'll look at companies that are doing research um, in glioblastoma first. So those are people that, you know, are maybe not as well served by existing companies out there because you can't do intracranial. Most companies can't do intracranial injection. And uh, as you might know, you want to model the blood brain barrier when you're doing a glioblastoma study. So that's sort of a really, you know, it's a very compelling uh, proposition to those companies. Um, you know, maybe less compelling is a breast model where, you know, you can just implant it in the mammary fat pad, which you can actually measure via calipers. So that's like a lower tier, you know, maybe you don't really need to go with Certus. You can go with one of our competitors like Crown Bio. So I sort of look at, you know, what they're doing how well funded they are, you know, sometimes I'm not going to go after these folks that don't really have a lot of money because they can't pay us. Um, you know, I'll, maybe I'll reach out to them. Sometimes I'm surprised. Um, but uh, yeah, that's sort of how I classify, like, do we do what they need and do they have the money to pay us? And then see, sort of stratify that based on interest. I have a related question. Um, so you talked about right now your corporate clients do they have a need and do they have the funding? But like, uh, it sounds like you also will have personal clients or just one-on-one -on -one patient clients. Um, do they typically reach out to you? And if so, like who's the pair in that case? Like, is it an insurance company or is it something that comes out of pocket? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't actually do the patient studies. Um, so we actually keep those really separate and that's a good thing because when you're working with a pharma client you know my head's in like do you have enough money for this you know like I'm asking those tough questions and that's not the right thing to ask a patient because these are out of pocket you know we're not covered by insurance we want to be that's part of our growth as a company but you can't ask those you know very technical BD focused things to a patient study so we have a whole nother division that manages those relationships it's generally with um the patient's family um so it's, it's generally uh, championed by someone else. Um, oftentimes it's brought to us also by our, uh, our academic partners, maybe they're on our advisory board, but they've seen the benefit of this and they refer their patients <clears throat> who could use this. You know, if you're, if you have breast cancer and it's HER2 positive, you know, go on Herceptin, you don't need this. But some clients, you know, 
they have sarcoma and they've been through tons of treatments and nothing has worked. Like that's the patient that needs us. So it's really about deciding that too. You know, we don't want a patient that doesn't need us to spend tons of money on this. It's about classifying that as well. But I had less vis visibility into that, but it is very different. It's a different, it's a different monster. So. <clears throat> And then going back to your corporate clients, then, since that's your focus, um, what's typically the timeline from start to finish, from point of contact, you know, to the end, assuming that they're, you know, pretty average or pretty good responsive client? Yeah, I mean, if they're responsive, we turned around studies in like two weeks, which is like pretty impressive, you know, so we don't have a lot of red tape. Uh, the last company I worked at is called Charles River, and that's a huge, huge organization that, you um, it does have a lot of experts, but also has a lot of bureaucracy. And we have a lot less of that oversight at my company now because we're around 40 people. Um, so we can get a turnaround quickly. What usually happens is customers come in hot, they're really excited, and then they get bogged down by their own bureaucracy. You know, like sometimes it'll take us two weeks just to sign an MSA, you know. Legal can really pull things up. Sometimes it takes time for them to get their they're um, therapeutic to dose um, either in vitro or in vivo. It'll take two weeks for that. So it's really so client to client dependent. And then, you know, once we start a study, all of these models have different growth rates. So, you know, sometimes, you know, I, there are studies that are ongoing since when I started. So, you know, studies can just take a really, really long time to get going. Um, but sometimes they do move fast and that's really nice. I like to just get it through, but it's not always the way it works. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. So we actually have some teamwork in the chat to clarify on uh, Lilia's previous points. So uh, what she was looking for was your best strategies or tips on identifying and finding a successful or potential partner or client. So what do you start looking for? What's a great potential client look like? Um, and I know you touched on a little bit, but if you can maybe go in a little more detail. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can go into sort of like the particulars of how I find clients. So I have a big long list that I pulled um, partially from, you know, my, my, my boss is actually from, uh, Crown Bio, which is a competitor of ours, but she has a lot of folks that she's done business with before that might be interested in this. So, you know, I'll go look on, on their LinkedIn, I'll look on their, uh, their like webpage and see what kind of things they're working on, where they're at. Maybe I'll read some of their news articles to see if they're already in the clinic or at what part of the stage they're in. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, sometimes they're just working on, say, like heme malignancies, um, liquid cancers, which we don't do. We're all um, we're all uh, solid tumors right now. Um, so that's, you know, that can disqualify a customer from me annoying them and reaching out. Um, but yeah, if, if I look at their page and I like to do it alphabetically, I've been doing it reverse alphabetically. I have this list and when I have time, I just start from the bottom and I look at people and see, you know, what are you doing? Are you a good candidate? Are you at the right stage? Do you have the right kinds of indications and cancers? Are you doing the right kinds of therapeutics? Um, some folks have maybe a radiotherapeutic that we don't have the cap capability to do in-house. Um, so that wouldn't be a good client. You know, sometimes I'll look at your money. Sometimes I'll just send you an email being hopeful. Um, depends on how I'm feeling, but do you have money? And from there, you know, I'll, I, I have a template of emails. I have a document full of email templates. I don't create these things from scratch. That would take too long, but I do customize each one. So that's part of that challenger methodology of tailoring to your client. If it's not specific to them, they're not going to care. Um, so it, it's got to be very specific to them. Sometimes I'll pull a list of models that they might be interested in. You know, hey, I see you're interested in you know, um, non-small cell lung cancer. Here's a list of our non-small cell lung cancers. You know, I'll attach some data on that to get you interested. And that's sort of how I do that reach, that outreach and finding the right clients. So hope, hope that answers your question, Lily. It sounded like it does because she thanked you in the chat. So um, that's actually all of our chat questions. I can open it up if anybody has any other questions to feel more comfortable speaking using your microphone, or we can leave it open for another minute in case anybody has any other questions uh, and maybe go from there. So yeah, feel free if you have a specific question, if you want to unmute yourself, if you want to use the chat, we're open to it, uh, but we leave it open for a minute because uh, we're pretty close to our scheduled time here. I have another question. Um, do you currently have a mentor? And if so, how did you identify them? Um, sales mentors. So when I first started in sales, um, and I've been in sales for about 
three years now. So my first sales job was at Charles River and I was selling research models, which are just mice and rats um, to do research. And I was very new. I had no idea what I was doing. So I read all these books um, and I found a mentor on LinkedIn. Um, there was this thing of people who are interested in being mentors. And this guy worked for a medical device company. So not that relevant, but he gave me some of the he, he had, he had like good verbiage. He was very encouraging. I don't talk to him anymore. It wasn't a long-term relationship. Um, I'd say my biggest mentor right now is my boss, which is just, that's exactly where you want to be. Your boss shouldn't be your only mentor because there is a complicated relationship there, but they should be a mentor. They should want to see you succeed. They should give you candid feedback. Um, so, you know, she's a great mentor, my colleague. Um, both of them have been in sort of the oncology serum business for just way longer than I have. And they have a lot of insight and they have a lot of feedback that's really helpful for me the way a mentor can. Um, and they're actually a lot closer to my process. So they see a lot of my emails. They, they're on a lot of these meetings. So they're closer than maybe a mentor might be in other situations. Um, but yeah, no, I think mentorship is really, really important. If any of you are interested in sales and would like a mentor, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm going to put my email in the chat so you can respond and get in touch with me, you know, add me on LinkedIn, um, whatever it is. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about sales and, you know, if it's the right path for you and if you have an interview, how to prepare, stuff like that. So it looks like Emmanuel has raised his hand. Emmanuel, did you have a question? Yes, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Sarah. I, I just wanted to know, um, uh, uh, Sarah, in your sales processes, have you a, a kind of uh, considered regulations or whether there's been any kind of um, uh, consideration at any point has regards to impact or regulation uh, when you are considering your sales process, either lead generation or um, uh, during conversation with a potential client or uh, during uh, uh, the point of actually completing the sales of uh, receiving payment? So overall, I want to know whether there has been any kind of uh, impact or consideration when it comes to re regulation. I'm sorry, I'm, I keep missing the key word in that sentence. Um, when it comes to okay, uh, let me let me take that let me take that again. I said uh, I want to know whether uh, regulations regulations um, FDA regulations or, or the other bodies, yes, mm -hmm. whether that there are um, there are kinds of policies or um, any kind of um, law or any kind of um, uh, any, any internet at all Lego that you take into consideration while working clients uh, through the sales process? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, there are regulations about how much you can email people. You know, you can't send bulk emails to people that's illegal. So there are all kinds of considerations with cold outreach. And of course, there are considerations, you know, within our business. Like you can't do whatever you want to these mice. There's lots of strict regulations as governed by like our ACOP and IACOC. We are overseen by organizations. Um, we have a regulatory person to sort of keep an eye on us, uh, make sure we're not doing anything that's unethical or you know possibly going to contaminate the study or contaminate the vivarium, which can be very expensive to clean. So there's lots of regulations governing um, our organization, but also the way that we contact customers. And the best way around it is to just one-on-one -on -one email, which is not gonna be illegal. Um, so if I reach out to you in a one-on-one -on -one email, that's not illegal. If you are a lead and you come into us and you say you don't want emails, and then I email you through a bulk list, that's illegal. Um, so there's some there's some like loose regulations. It's less there's less regulatory um, from my BB operations as there is from my study design considerations. You know, there's quite a bit to consider there. Um, but yeah, yeah, regulations. And I was in quality for like five years and uh, that that background has always served me very well in this role. It's definitely always gonna be something that's really good to know. Your clients want to know that you're considering the regulations that you're thinking deeply about these things. Um, so yeah, if you're doing regulatory stuff at KGI, even if you transition out of that to something as silly as business development, it's always gonna serve you well. So, yeah. Great, thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, those of you who haven't seen it, uh, Dr. Kumar dropped a link to some success, to being successful potentially maybe as an introvert in sales. So if you have a chance, click that link. It'll be really useful for you. Yeah, Sarah, this is just to. I know it's time. Time is up, but just to add to your point, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to be an extrovert all the time, and and especially in a, in an area like 
healthcare and life sciences where you have educated people, you're dealing with educated people, right? So, so, uh, so I, just, I just get that question all the time as an OB professor, I get that question all, all the time. So I, I just wanted to add to that. So thanks for mentioning that. Completely agree. Don't let it scare you away if you don't think you're a salesperson archetype. If you asked anyone that I went to KGI with, you know, like, did you think that she would be a salesperson? They would all say, no, oh my God, she's in regulatory, you know, she's so shy. But, you know, it's something that you can grow into. It's something that, you know, you don't have to be outgoing. I'm still a very introverted person, but I do like having scientific conversations and I like finding the solution for my clients. That's what drives me, not the money. I don't care about that as much, um, but I wanna do the right thing for the client. And I think that's the most rewarding way to do sales. And if that's something that resonates with you, you know, don't rule it out as a possibility, so. All right, great. So that's, it looks like all the time and I really do wanna be um, aware of all the time for all of you. I know you have other appointments, other places to be. So I, first of all, I wanna thank you all for being here, for joining us. And I especially wanna thank Sarah for sharing your insight and learning a little bit more about your company and the great work that you're doing. And, and we really do appreciate you stopping by and, and informing us and really showing all the great work that us that our, our graduates are doing out there. So thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you to all of you who are, who are here. If you have any questions for her, I believe in the chat, she dropped her email. If you have questions about 101, really appreciate you being open to some of these uh, potential students, graduates, it's all these, all these people here at KGI who are, you know, following those same steps. So um, any questions at all, feel free to reach out about this process as well with the KGI admissions email. And uh, that is pretty much the end of the session. We wish you all the very best. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank right. you. Appreciate it. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Ask me okay, questions. Right. I'm here to help you. You guys are all very promising. I'm excited to see you grow and learn through KGI. It's going to be great. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Great. Bye.